re start recording. Okay. So we're going to be talking about the brachial plexus. And what I want to do is, because brachial plexus, I'm not going to lie, is not an easy topic. Okay. It's not very, it's not hard either, but it just needs a lot and a lot of repetition. Um, so I know that you guys, okay, with a show of hand, who actually watched like the, um, the video, the lecture one. I'm trying to. Okay. I think we, most of us did because we had a quiz on it last Friday. I did a quiz. Okay. Um, so this is just going to be like, you know, going over it very quickly before we move on to like the videos and so on. Um, and this is a topic that when I was a student, honestly, if I knew that I would have been teaching it, I may have been you know, maybe I would have paid a little bit more attention. Um, the lecture, the, uh, usually I give the lecture when we were on ground. So um, again, you know, pay attention folks. You never know 20, 30 years down the road from now what you'll be doing with these lectures, okay? So okay, with that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and just share this. Share application. How do I share this, folks? I'm just going to share the whole everything. There we go. OK, so now you should be able to see the slides. OK, these are the exact same slides that Dr. Ahmed used for the lecture. And I just kind of picked a couple of them to go over, well, maybe more than a couple. And we'll start kind of like at the very beginning of what, um, of how we make these plexuses, where we get the spinal nerves, we break them down into, you know, the eight cervical, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, five sacral, and one coccygeal. And then we remember that we said for each spinal nerve, it splits into two rami or two branches. There was a, vent a ventral and a dorsal. The Ventral rami are the ones that are going to be making all of these um, plexuses that, you know, including the brachial plexus that we'll talk about today. The dorsal ones, those just basically go to the skin and muscles of the back. Again, when you talk about a brachial or, or any plexus, you are going to be saying that, you know, the it's the ventral rami of, in this case, of the brachial plexus C5, 6, 7, 8, and T1. Okay, so we'll... Um, the first thing, in my opinion, in a, any plexus is to know like how the breakdown is. So you have the roots, trunks, divisions, cords, and then branches. And um, I, there's this mnemonic that I was able to pull out. This is the G-rated mnemonic. You guys can go ahead and, you know, Google, I guess, the R-rated ones. But this is the one that I could share in a public setting. So um, the Randy Travis drinks cold beverages. I had no idea who Randy Travis was, to be honest. But when I Googled him, he's a singer, I guess. And so roots, trunks, divisions, chords, and B would stand for your um, final or um, the branches that come at the very end. So where is the brachial plexus? Where do we find all of these different parts? Well, remember, they all come from the neck. Okay, so we're talking about C5, 6, 7, 8, and T1. So the majority of these roots are actually in the spine or in the cervical spine. And then they will start branching out. So you'll find the roots, trunks, and, you know, kind of like these divisions too. They'll, they're find in, found in the neck and in the upper part of either want to say the shoulder if you're going from up here or in the axillary area if you're kind of going from down there and then the these nerves kind of go this way and then they go down into the upper limbs so everything that was superior when it goes into the upper limbs will become lateral while everything that is inferior as it goes into the upper limb it those will become medial Okay, so these trunks that are superior, when they go down into your upper limb, those become lateral. Again, inferior would go down, will, those will become medial, on the, will be on the medial side. 
they're all found in the posterior triangle of the neck. So I know you guys didn't really go over the triangles of the neck, but the sternocleidomand, which was that muscle that goes from the sternum to the mastoid process behind the ear, so that it's a kind of like a slim muscle, divides the neck into an anterior triangle, so anything in front of it, and a posterior triangle. These um, um, structures are found in the posterior triangle of the neck. Okay, so it's kind of towards the back of the neck. Any questions so far? Is everybody fine? You folks here? At Everybody's which point good? did you say? Oh, at which point did you say that it branched into the arm? Was it at the like um, branches or at the or at the divisions? Oh, at the when course? does it start going into the arm? So the divisions yeah. is really kind of like at the at the tip of the arm, kind of like at the shoulder area, okay? You'll see these cords um, and some of the branches in the axillary area. Then these branches are going to go all the way down into the upper limb, okay? So the really the majority of the plexus is either in the neck or in the axillary area. You could actually dissect it either from the top from the shoulder, but that's a lot harder because you have lots of bones and things. So when we dissect them, in the lab, we actually fully extend the arm and start dissecting through the axillary area. Okay, so did that answer your question? I know I talked a lot, but did that actually answer what you were asking? Yes, about? thank you. Okay, no problem. Okay, so we'll kind of, I have all of this again, like I said, it's all about repetition, repeating this over and over and over again until um, like you are totally bored to death of hearing this. And um, I know that you know, listening to me going on for two hours every Tuesday can be already boring. But seriously, this is the only way to get this down. So for our roots, we have again C5, 6, 7, 8, and T1. These are your um, ventral rami. Okay, remember ventral rami are the ones that make your plexus. And then these rami are going to start braiding and then branching and then going back and braiding and so on. So five and six roots, those unite to make your upper trunk, okay? C7 is all by itself. It'll make a middle trunk. And then the lower trunk is made out of C8 and T1. Okay, now each of these trunks will divide into two divisions, a posterior one, and an anterior division. Now all three posterior divisions unite to become a posterior cord. The upper two anterior divisions become the lateral cord and the anterior division of the bottom one on its own will become the medial cord. Now these cords, lateral, posterior, and medial, those are found in the axilla, so in the armpit and they are named according to their relationship to the axillary artery. Okay, so the axilla, it's not on here, it's obviously removed from this image so you could see the posterior cord, but had it been here, it would be a structure right over here hiding the posterior cord. Okay, so lateral, medial, and posterior, again, are named according to their relationship. If you want to be very specific about it, it is, would be the second part of the axillary artery. Now each of these cords will start giving up, you know, their final branches. And um, these are the bigger ones. There are smaller ones that I'll talk about in, the, in a minute, but these are your bigger ones. Um, lateral will give musculocutaneous and a little portion, so the lateral root of the median nerve. So the median nerve is a very big nerve. It pretty much supplies you know, the majority of the anterior part of the arm and lots of structures in the forearm. So it has two different roots, a lateral root and a medial root. The lateral root is from the lateral cord. The medial root is from the medial cord. Okay, and again, these two roots combine together to make a median nerve. Now the posterior cord will give a radial nerve. It pretty much kind of looks like it's continuation and it will give them kind of a small twig of a nerve known as the axillary nerve. The radial 
nerve is the nerve of the posterior part of the arm and forearm. So remember again, these are coming from their posterior cord. That posterior cord is more towards the back of the armpit of the axilla, and then it branches off into that radial, and that is going to supply most of the muscles of the posterior part of the arm and forearm. And those are all extensors. So they will help in extending the elbow, extending the wrist, extending fingers, and so on. Now, for the medial cord, that will move on, continue to become an ulnar nerve. And as I said, it will also give out a little branch to help in making the median nerve. Now, these small branches, we'll move, you know, we'll discuss those in one second. This is the same boring stuff all over again. It's just a different way of showing it. So, you know, some students prefer this. Others prefer this image. Um, so, it, you know, so I'm just showing it in different ways so that you guys, you know, pick and choose whichever one you prefer to, to, um, to use. So do you guys need me to go over it again? I, I can. It's, I just don't want to, you know, sound too boring. So if you're good, I can move on. If not, let me know. So one more time, or are we all good? I think we're good. You're good? Okay. I'm good, too. Okay, perfect. Okay, so oh, we already mentioned that, that the lateral, medial, and posterior cord are according to their relationship to the axillary artery. And here you can see the cords up here. And then they start giving out those um, their branches. So here is your lateral root and medial root to become the median nerve. You could also see the ulnar ulnar nerve coming from the um, coming from that medial cord. This one is actually my personal favorite, but doesn't have to be yours because it shows, you know, kind of like the how things work and um, with the brachial plexus, and it also shows the branches. So here would be your roots. This is these are your trunks, divisions, cords, and then your terminal branches. And it shows the the branches out of each part of the brachial plexus. So for the roots, you get a little you know these little contributions from five, six, and seven, and those are going to make the phrenic nerve. So there is a saying in science that C5, 6, and 7 keep the phrenic, what was the saying? Okay. Okay, I can't remember what the saying was, but there is one. If, if it comes back, I'll let you know. But anyway, the 5, 6, and 7 um, so make the phrenic nerve, and the phrenic nerve is the nerve that um, innervates the diaphragm. Okay, so you know, this nerve is an extremely important nerve, and will you can see that this actually comes all the way from the neck that supplies the diaphragm that is that muscle between the chest and the abdomen. So this nerve is pretty much, you know, it's kind of like a long nerve because, again, it'll have to go all the way from the neck down to the abdomen. Um, does anybody know, if anybody took like an embryology class, know why the diaphragm gets its supply from the neck? Why doesn't it just get its supply like from the thoracic um, spinal cord. Any idea? Okay, so that um, what happens is that the diaphragm actually starts to, um, in, in embryo or in the fetus, the diaphragm used to be all the way up here in the neck, and then it descends down into its position as the lungs and the heart are developing. And that's why it kind of pulls down its nerve supply with it as it's descending. Okay, so again, the um, nerve supply of the diaphragm calls, comes all the way up from the next D5, 6, and 7. The trunks, we have the, um, the suprascapular nerve and a little tiny nerve known as a nerve to subclavius. There are no branches from the divisions, which is nice. And then we have these little cords. The cord, uh, the lateral cord will give out a lateral pectoral nerve, 
musculocutaneous, and the lateral branch of the median nerve. The posterior cord will give out axillary and radial, which is the biggest of all of these branches, but it also gives us a couple of smaller branches like the superior and inferior subscapular nerve and the thoracodorsal. Medial cord gives out medial pectoral, medial cutaneous nerve of the arm and of the forearm, and then continues to become the ulnar nerve. So these two nerves, medial and lateral pectoral nerves, those are going to supply the pectoral uh, muscles. So pectoral, pectoralis major, um, yeah, pectoralis major and minor, and they are named according to their origin. So you see lateral comes from the corresponding lateral cord, medial from the medial cord, but as they descend down into the chest area, they over they uh, crisscross over each other, okay? So they um, kind of decussate, and then at the chest, they change their orientation. So medial actually becomes lateral, and lateral becomes medial. So when we're looking at the video, um, I actually don't remember at which level they show the nerve, but when we were dissecting in the um, in the actual lab, they would we would dissect the medial lateral very close to the where they innervate the pectoralis muscles, and at that point, the lateral pectoral would be medial and the medial pectoral would be lateral because again they crossed over um, and changed their orientation anatomically speaking, but at the very origins that um, you know, the orientation holds, okay? Hopefully that wasn't too confusing. The suprascapular nerve, and I'm actually maybe keep this until next week because this is where we talk about a couple of triangles and um, quadrangular spaces and so on. Um, so I'll just go over the nerve really quick. The suprascapular nerve will be deep to the supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscles and their name according to the relationship to the spine of the scapula, and they innervate both of these muscles, okay? And then um, you can see the rest of the muscles, like I said, we'll keep that until next, um, next week. Okay. Now, before we ask, before we go on to watch one of the movies, does anybody have any questions? No? Um, is, oops, what am I doing? No, okay, so we're good. Can I go and say that I lied on something? And nobody caught the lie, which is nice. But it kind of hit me now that the contribution from C5, not 5, 6, and 7. I, you know, please delete that or, you know, yeah, delete that, whatever I said. Okay, so C5, and now I remember the saying is C5 keeps the phrenic alive. That's where the saying comes from. So it, it was because of that rhyme. So C5 is your contribution to the phrenic nerve. Five, six, and seven is that long thoracic nerve. So I apologize for that. Um, so are you good on that or do you need me to go over that part one more time? Everybody Okay, so I'm going to take that as a good sign. Okay, so now it's movie time, folks. So um, this is actually my laptop, but my personal laptop. It's not UDMs. So maybe we could watch Netflix as opposed to these um, lab movies that we watch all the time. Okay, no, nobody's interested. Okay, what's what are you got? What is everybody watching on Netflix these days? Nothing interesting? You guys are too busy? Okay. So, Scrubs? Wait, Scrubs, isn't that nothing? Scrubs, is that still on, or is that re are those reruns? Sign? On will, oh. Yeah, I do the um, those shows, too. My daughter, it's it's old. Okay, I thought there was something new on there. Okay, yes, yeah, so I saw those before. Um, okay, well, the, I think the like the last thing I watched was with my fourth grader Garfield, which I think is hilarious for the new crazy. The Great British Show. It is great. I love those shows too. So there's like Cupcake Wars and things like that, which I enjoy watching with my. <laughs> 
Um, okay, so I'm going to stop sharing this for a minute so we can go and watch the video. Master Chef, yeah, that's, he's mean. I'm not going to lie. Um, those are really mean. It's just stressful for me. Exactly. It stresses me out too, Rachel. I agree. So let's see how we're going to have to go back and share this. Okay, fine. We'll watch an actual anatomy movie. I have not watched those. I have no idea what those are. Um, maybe I'll put on my list whenever I have time. Okay, so while this video is loading, a disclaimer here, this is an actual cadaver. Um, can we watch Shrek? I wouldn't mind, but I don't think, um, you know, since we're actually recording <laughs> this, I don't think the students will, um, you know, like that on the recording. Maybe later. We'll hang out after class and do that. Say so, so the uh, like I said this is actual an actual cadaver. It's basically the um, upper limb, okay. And you might find other structures surrounding the upper limb, but I just want to make sure that you are kind of mentally prepared at what we're going to be looking at. So here we go. So is it just, no, I just stopped it just to make sure. So some of you cannot hear it? I can't hear it. Okay, so let me go and see. Well, I'm glad somebody said something. Okay, let me just take it all the way back up and try to reshare this. Hold on. Um. Now we have flipped the body to the anterior uh, position, or we can say now? the supine position, the anatomical supine position, okay, awesome. where you have the hand Perfect. forced or actually made up in this direction. That's called the supine position. So we can also look at the muscles that are present on the anterior compartment of the arm. And these are going to be the biceps muscles, which have the two heads here separated. And if you turn it a little bit to the side, you can see another muscle underneath, which is actually attached to the brachial, to the, um, to the humerus right there. And also the other head will go and attach on the coracoid process up there, and that would be coracobrachialis. Here you can see coracobrachialis. And you can see there is a nerve that is actually penetrating that muscle. And if we follow these nerves right here, you're going to see they are actually coming. This nerve is coming from the um, brachial plexus, and most probably this is going to be the musculocutaneous nerve. Now, if we're going to look at the posterior part of the arm, 
we still have some of the deltoid muscles here not fully removed. But if we move, remove it or look at it posteriorly right here, we can see the triceps muscles on the posterior aspect of the arm. Now we're going to have a quick look at the brachial plexus area right here. And you can see the scapula has been detached. So that gives a little bit more flexibility to look at these different structures of the brachial plexus. And one of the most important things that will help you to identify the brachial plexus area is identifying the M shape. And here I am holding the M shape. You can see that these nerves are making the letter M. The most superior one will be the masculocutaneous. The middle one will be the median nerve, and this one will be the ulnar nerve. And that will be making the abbreviation MMU, MMU, M for musculocutaneous, M for median, and U for ulnar nerve. And if we're going to look right here, we're going to see there is a, a blood vessel, a thick blood vessel, is actually going above the M formation right here. It's going in between, it's going actually posterior to the uh, this branches of the brachial plexus and is continuing on to the arm. So that portion right here will be actually a continuation of the subclavian artery, which will become the axillary artery at the area of the axilla. Then it will become the brachial artery at the area of the arm. Now also going to be able to see the vein that will run to it, but I cannot see it clearly right here. But most importantly, there's going to be another nerve that belongs to the posterior cord will be running behind the axillary artery in that case. And this is the axillary artery. So it's the same subclavian artery, but it gets a different name according to the area it runs on. So if it runs in the axillary area, it will be axillary artery. If it runs in the arm, we call it brachial artery. Behind it, we'll find the posterior cord, and the posterior cord will actually continue on as the, here is the M, we take it off, here is brachial artery at this point, and here's the posterior cord that will become the radial nerve. So there is the radial nerve is running behind all these structures. Okay, so any questions about that video? Is everybody okay? Did I lose anybody? Okay, I just thought because I clicked something, I thought I got kicked out of the meeting. Okay. Um, so let me go back here. Okay. So there are other couple of videos that we watch are, um, about the brachial plexus before we move on to the blood vessels of the upper limb. So one more, let me make sure that I share this correctly so you can hear it. Okay, so this is from the um, Acklin's video, Acklin's Anatomy, um, and then we'll I'll show you like how to get to the brachial plexus on the VH the sector too. So here it goes. Folks, are you seeing the blackboard or are you actually watching the video? Blackboard? 
I thought I sh asked it to share the content. Yours. Now let's look at the nerve. Is it right Between now? About here and here, the five spinal nerves Perfect. unite and divide. Unite again and divide again. Perfect. The tangle which this produces is called the brachial plexus. It's not really too formidable. At the end of the brachial plexus, the four main nerves of the arm emerge. The muscular cutaneous, the median, the ulnar, and the radial. In the course of the brachial plexus, the nerves which supply the shoulder region are given off. We'll look at the main components of the brachial plexus first, then at the local branches. Here's the brachial plexus with several of its small branches removed so we can see the big picture. We'll also remove Okay, so what you're looking at right here, this all used to be covered by a bigger muscle called the pectoralis major. So the pectoralis major was um, dissected. And what you're seeing down here is the pectoralis minor um, and the clavicle and the deltoid muscle. That The deltoid muscle is the muscle that kind of gives you the contour of the shoulder. So I just wanted to point out that in order to find the parts of the brachial plexus, you have to remove the pec, pec major, which is not even showing in the video. Um, and then you'll see here as he dissects the pec minor. Remove pectoralis minor. Here are the five roots of the brachial plexus. They are in fact ventral rami of their respective spinal nerves. They emerge, as we've seen, from between the anterior scalene and middle scalene muscles. The top two roots join and the bottom two join, and the middle one, C7, stays alone. These three big units are called the three trunks, upper, middle, and lower. Each trunk divides. Here's one of them dividing into an anterior and a posterior division. Of the three anterior divisions, the upper two unite, and the lower one stays alone. The three posterior divisions all unite, as we'll see in a minute. Once that's all happened, there are again three big units now called cords, lateral, medial, and posterior. They surround the axillary artery. The lateral cord divides to become the muscular cutaneous nerve and one half of the median nerve. The medial cord divides to become the ulnar nerve and the other half of the median nerve. This arrangement produces an M-shaped pattern of nerves, muscular cutaneous, median, and ulnar. Now let's see the posterior cord. We need to remove the medial cord, the lateral cord, and the artery to get a good look at it. Here's the posterior cord all by itself. Sometimes it starts dividing before all three of its posterior divisions have united. Its principal branches are the axillary nerve, which we'll see again, and the radial nerve. Now that we've looked at the main components of the brachial plexus, let's look at the nerves which supply the muscles of the shoulder region. Some of these arise from the cords of the brachial plexus. Some arise in other ways. Let's look at the ones that arise from the cords first. We were looking at a simplified dissection before. Now we'll see the details. The medial cord gives rise to one local nerve, the lateral cord to two. The one from the medial cord is the medial pectoral nerve. It's one of a pair. Here's its partner, the lateral pectoral nerve, which arises from the lateral cord. The pectoral nerves supply pectoralis major and pectoralis minor. Also arising from the lateral cord is the muscular cutaneous nerve. It supplies three upper arm muscles, one of which we've seen, coracobrachialis. The other two we'll see in the next section. The posterior cord, here it is again with all its branches intact, has four branches. The axillary nerve runs round the neck of the humerus, 
along with the posterior circumflex humeral artery to supply the deltoid muscle and also teres minor. The subscapular nerves, an upper and a lower, supply subscapularis and teres major. The thoracodorsal nerve supplies latissimus dorsi. Now let's see the shoulder muscle nerves which don't arise from the cords of the brachial plexus. Of these, one is the branch of a trunk, two arise from the roots of the brachial plexus, and two aren't part of the plexus at all. Arising from the upper trunk is the suprascapular nerve, which supplies supraspinatus and infraspinatus. Arising from the C5 root and passing through the middle scalene muscle is the dorsal scapular nerve. It supplies the rhomboid muscles. Arising from the C5, 6, and 7 roots, the long thoracic nerve emerges through the middle scalene muscle, runs deep to all three trunks of the brachial plexus, and supplies serratus anterior. Trapezius gets its nerve supply from the spinal accessory nerve. Lastly, levator scapulae gets a private nerve supply from the nearby roots of C3, 4, and 5. Okay, so that was that video. Let me stop sharing that here. Okay, so the rest are for the blood vessels. Um, so let's go to the VH dissector. Any questions before we do that, though? Let me go back and take a look what you guys were typing. Okay. Okay, so this right here um, is the VH dissector. Let me go like to what you would actually, how to get to this place. So this is the start. When you open up, the picture is a little bit different, but um, this is the page that you get up. You can go to, you want to go to anatomy pathways and then scroll down until you find the nervous system. Go down to spinal cord and spinal nerves. And then you want to scroll down until you find the plexuses, so brachial plexus. Okay, and this is what will come up. Okay. Just to be very honest, this is not the best of images for the brachial plexus, but it does show you, it does give you an idea of, you know, you can see here all of the roots. It is kind of hard to make up the trunks and divisions and so on. But you can appreciate how all of these nerves will go through the upper limb and then they supply everything in the hand. So let, if I increase that, if you could go back and see that ghost, here you could see how, you know, these nerves are going all the way down to the fingers. Okay, we could, if I do that, and start highlighting things, you could show you the roots. Um, Again, it's not really the best one um, for this, for the nerves. I just wanted to show you where it was. Okay, so not my favorite. Not a big fan of this, to be honest. But it might work better for other structures, but definitely not, not these nerves at all. Okay, so let us go then to whatever we have next, but I do have to share it differently. Stop sharing and go back to this. Okay, so going back 
to where we start stop. So any questions about the brachial plexus before we move on to the blood vessels of the upper limb? If anybody has questions, um, if you can unmute and feel free to ask. Okay, then, so we will move on to the uh, blood vessels of the upper limb. And I know we're not talking about the heart, but I feel like to uh, better understand where the subclavian arteries are coming from, um, it is it, kind of important to discuss the parts of the, or the branches off of the arch of the aorta. So the arch of the aorta will give off the brachiocephalic trunk, and from there, we branch off to a right subclavian artery and a right common carotid. So this, that common carotid will go up on, um, on the right side of the neck, while the right subclavian will enter the upper limb. Moving on to the left side, we have the left common carotid and the left subclavian, and those originate directly off of the arch of the aorta. On the right side, though, again, we have that little extension. So the heart is on the left side of the chest, and it could directly give off a left common carotid and a left subclavian. But it can't give a common carotid because the right side is all the way over here. So what it does is it gives out that little extension, and that, again, is your brachiocephalic trunk. That little extension kind of goes, you know, gives it a hand to reach the right side of the body. And then the brachiocephalic branches off to the right common carotid and the right subclavian. And the brachiocephalic gets its name from brachium which is the um, upper limb, the arm, and cephalic, which is head. So the trunk is actually telling you what it would branch into, a brachial artery or the, you know, to the brachium and to the cephalic area. Okay, so I, I just brought in this model to kind of emphasize or to show the different origins of the right and the left subclavian arteries. And then that's up, these subclavian arteries will enter um, you know, will go down there and it keeps on changing its name depending on where it is in the body. So there right here is the subclavium. It goes underneath the clavicle and that's kind of, you know, where the name comes from. And when it reaches the, ax the axillary area, it'll change its name into the axillary artery until it reaches about the lower level of teres major and that's when it becomes the brachial artery. The brachial artery goes through the arm and then branches till it reaches the elbow and then it branches into the radial and the ulnar arteries. So here are some of the branches of the brachial. Um, you can see here, or and the axillary. So you can see here in the axillary area, it gives out an anterior and posterior circumflex humeral arteries. So these are basically two arteries that are going to hug the upper part of the humerus, hence the name anterior and posterior circumflex. So it goes around humeral artery. And they anastomose, mean they meet each other, um, and they help in the arterial supply of the uh, shoulder joint and the surrounding structures. Okay, It'll also give off a branch known as the deep brachial artery. The deep brachial has another name, and that's known as the profunda brachii. So remember when, you know, how you say like, oh, that is very pronounced, that's a profound statement, or, or you know, that's deep. Okay, so the profunda brachii artery, um, its other name, its nickname is the deep brachial artery. So if you see either one, you know, these are not two different arteries. We're talking about the same thing. And the brachial artery keeps on going along the medial part of the humerus and then anterior to the humerus. And as it is distal to the elbow, it'll divide again into your radial and artery, uh, sorry, ulnar arteries. It gives off a superior and inferior ulnar collaterals. And as you can see here, those anastomos as well in order to help in the blood supply, the elbow joint. And these, um, and a humeral nutrient artery. And that basically goes into um, inside of the actual humerus bone and supplies the bone itself. Okay, so I think that is pretty much what I wanted to say about the arteries. Um, know that in the limb, there are veins, of course, okay? Not all of the veins follow the path of the arteries, okay? So most of the time, 
um, when you're learning anatomy, we just say, you know, like artery and accompanying vein. But the veins in the upper limb are a little bit different, and I'll go over them in pretty much our next segment of this lab. Okay. So let's go ahead and watch the movie that we have on that. And I wish there was an easier way to just share all this stuff without having to keep on changing how we're sharing. There has to be a smarter way to just go. We'll move on now to look at the arteries. In the dissections that follow, all the accompanying veins have been removed to simplify the picture. To get a good look at the artery as it runs from here to here, we need to remove pectoralis major. Now only three structures stand between us and it. Here's the artery, passing behind the anterior scalene muscle, behind the clavicle, and behind pectoralis minor. Three names for one artery, subclavian, axillary, brachial. Let's see where it begins. Here's a deeper dissection with the chest wall removed. Here are the divided ends of the clavicle, the first rib with the anterior scalene muscle, and the second rib. In the middle, we're looking at the trachea and the commented arteries, the right and the left. Okay, so this, for example, like is a perfect image that could be screenshotted and used. Okay, so um, as you're watching these videos, you want to pretend that you are us and think about what would be a perfect picture to snapshot or to screenshot and um, use. Okay. And here you can see again the arch of the aorta. You could see the um, brachiocephalic trunk as it branches into the subclavian or the you want to be specific the right subclavian and the right common carotid and then right here is your left common carotid and that is the left subclavian okay. on the right side the subclavian artery arises along with the common carotid from the brachiocephalic trunk which in turn arises from the arch of the aorta on the left side the subclavian artery arises directly from the arch of the aorta. In the early part of its course, as it passes over the dome of the pleura, the subclavian artery gives off some major branches, which we'll see in other parts of the atlas. These are the internal thoracic, the thyrocervical trunk, and the vertebral. In addition, the subclavian gives off two branches to the back and shoulder region. These are the transverse cervical, and the suprascapular arteries. These two are variable. Sometimes they arise here, sometimes here. The main artery, now called the axillary, next gives off two branches behind pectoralis minor. They're the thoracocromial and the lateral thoracic arteries. In the axilla, three more branches arise, often close together, the subscapular, and the two circumflex humeral arteries, the anterior and the posterior. The posterior circumflex humeral winds round behind the neck of the humerus. Finally, the artery, now known as the brachial artery, passes on down the upper arm. Okay, so he is done with that. And the last movie we have are would be the, our last video is the veins. So I want to wait until we cover the veins together before we watch it. Okay. It is showing that my connection is poor. So if you guys cannot hear me well, just let me know. Maybe if I turn off the camera, it will be better. But if if things kind of get really bad, please somebody let me know. Okay. Just don't let me keep on talking here. And um, you guys cannot hear me. Okay, thank you for thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So we'll talk here about the veins. 
as I mentioned, that veins usually accompany the artery and they usually have the same names. That is not really the case when it comes to the upper limb, at least for the portion of the upper limb that we're covering. We don't cover like all of the upper limb, all the way the forearm and so on. This is pretty much it when it comes to um, blood vessels. So for the veins, we have, remember that the venous drainage is different. Arterial drainage goes from in the direction of shoulder down to the elbow, down to the wrist. That's arterial supply. Venous drainage is in the other direction. Okay, so it'll go from distal, so from your wrist um, to the elbow, up to the shoulder, all the, so that the deoxygenated blood can go towards the heart. Okay, so when we talk about veins, we will be going in the opposite direction. Okay, so we have these two veins. There's the basilic vein, and that is found um, right, you know, goes along the lower border of the deltoid muscle. That is known, again, as your basilic vein. Did I say basilic? I think I did. So it's the cephalic vein. And the basilic vein um, is another big vein where they both of them kind of unite to become the axillary vein. To remember which one is which, the cephalic vein is more towards the head. Okay, so cephalic again means head. Basilic vein is the one that's on the base. Okay, so there's your cephalic, that's your basilic. They unite to become the axillary vein. And um, axillary vein here does accompany the axillary artery. And then the axillary vein. Um, goes underneath the clavicle and it changes its name to the subclavian vein. And the subclavian vein unites with the internal jugular vein to become a um, brachiocephalic trunk, a brachiocephalic vein. Of clinical importance is this little tiny vein that, it's not tiny, but it does unite two bigger veins. And that is known as the median cubital vein. The median cubital vein connects the cephalic to the basilic vein, and that's the vein that we use for a venipuncture, like if you want to get a blood drawn, as you can see here down in this image down here. Um, so again, the median cubital vein, cubital means um, elbow, so it runs across the elbow. Most of us actually can see that median cubital vein. It's visible um, you know, when you look at the interior part of the elbow. But we do not use it for long-term IV solutions. So if somebody is getting IV fluid, like intravenous fluids, we do not go through that vein. We rather either use the cephalic or the basilic vein, okay? Because as you move your elbow, you know, you can easily um, disconnect or um, even hurt the rupture of the vein and so on. So we kind of use these bigger veins, the cephalic and the basilic vein, where you do not have any joints that would ruin the, um, the IV. Okay, so that is it for what I have to show you. Now we will move on to the video. And again, was it laggy when I was showing the video the first time with this low connection? Or were you guys okay? It was fine? Okay, thank you. Um, so let's do it then. Here we go. Here goes nothing. Let's start by looking at the veins. We can be quite brief about this since the veins parallel the arteries in most important respects. It'll be helpful to start on the outside and progress inward, removing some muscles as we go along. Here, in the groove between pectoralis major and deltoid, is the cephalic vein coming up from the arm. It's a vein that doesn't have an accompanying artery. To see where it's going, will remove pectoralis major. Here's the cephalic vein. Together with other veins from the shoulder region, it joins the main vein of the upper extremity, the subclavian vein. We'll focus our attention on this important vein. 
the subclavian vein comes up from the arm and passes beneath pectoralis minor. Emerging from beneath pectoralis minor, it passes over the outer surface of the first rib. Here's the first rib, and under the subclavius muscle and the clavicle. To follow the subclavian vein further, we'll remove the clavicle, the subclavius muscle, and this muscle, the sternocleidomastoid. Here we are behind the medial end of the clavicle, which went from here, this is the cut end of the clavicle, to here, this was the sternoclavicular joint. Here's pectoralis minor, here's the curve of the first rib, and here's scalenus anterior. These structures, the subclavian artery and the brachial plexus, we'll be seeing in a minute. Let's follow the vein. Just as the subclavian vein reaches the medial border of the first rib. So I just paused this for one minute because I wanted to point out the differences between these structures. OK, so that you can see them here all in one uh, picture. You can appreciate the difference between a vein and the artery. OK, those are pretty obvious. The vein is deeper in color. The artery is a little bit more on the white side. Um, it, while the nerves are also white. So how can we differentiate between a vein, I mean, between an artery and a nerve, okay? When we're actually in the lab, you could touch the structures, not on the exam, but at least when you're dissecting, you'll a you're able to touch. Is it fresh, meaning the cadaver? Oh, okay, this in the video. Um, so yes, in, in this video, yes, I believe the person, you know, they've preserved the body in such a way where everything is very fresh. When we dissect in the cadaver lab, it is definitely pretty much grayish. Everything is pretty much gray in color and it's very different from what you're seeing here. So these videos um, are awesome, to be honest. Like they show you really what if you would, if you are opening up a patient during surgery, like this is pretty much how it looks like. There's lots of other stuff going on, um, but um, pretty much this is really more uh, real as opposed to the cadavers. But again, you could really appreciate the differences in color. So, um, you know, I just wanted to kind of pause to show you how to differentiate between a vein and an artery as, be you know, differentiating between an artery and a nerve that's a little bit harder though because again color wise they look the same and in the past what dr ahmed would, would do is that on the test exams like she would ask identify say the vessel okay so if she had this flagged for you she would ask to identify the vessel so it would really be your job to, to figure out is this an artery or a vein um while if she would if she wants you to identify one of the nerves she could say like identify a struct the structure Okay, so the structure is really, that could either be a muscle, could be a nerve, could be, you know, what have you. But again, for the blood vessels, she would, you, most of the time she would ask to identify a vessel. So that you might want to ask her if she plans on doing that this semester as well. Okay, so we will move Which on with here, the rest of the video. It's joined from above by the main vein of the head and neck, the internal jugular vein. Together, the subclavian and internal jugular veins form the brachiocephalic vein. The brachiocephalic vein passes medial to the first rib and enters the chest. The dome of the pleura lies immediately behind it. Here's the pleura. To follow the brachiocephalic vein into the chest, we'll remove these muscles. And we'll also remove this part of the anterior chest wall. We'll also remove the other clavicle. Now looking inside the chest, here are the divided ends of the two first ribs. And here's the divided end of the sternum. Here are the two brachiocephalic veins, the right and the left. A little to the right of the midline, they join together to form the superior vena cava. Apart from what we've just seen, the veins of the region correspond so closely to the arteries that we don't need to consider them separately. 
Okay, so before we go ahead and do our quiz, I need questions in regards to the brachial plexus or the blood vessels. We are good. Okay. So for is what I'm going to be doing um, is pretty much what we used to do in actual lab, whereas I'll put up structures for you. You'll see the image, and if you feel like you are able to answer it, go ahead and you know volunteer yourself to do that. So just raise your hand, um, you know, the virtual hand if that's better, and claim it as your question and go ahead and answer. So let me share that. Application, Chrome tab. Um, share a file, maybe? Share a file. Kind of like Family Feud, yeah. <laughs> so the fastest, you know, if you find something that you want to claim, go ahead and claim it. Spinal nerves, all files. And I don't understand why you cannot share a Word document. Okay. Forget this way of sharing. Let me share it some other way. Oh, and I have to tell you guys, like we have this setting for so my fourth grader, he gets he school gave him like a laptop this big. And when they're sharing things on there, he can barely see. So his older brother set it up for him where he the laptop is now attached to this bigger screen. And it feels like I don't know, it feels like he's that's way too much of a setup for a fifth grader, but I guess it is what it is. Our house looks weird right now, seriously. Okay, so can you see this now, folks? Got to yeah. the yeah. yeah. Okay, so you're able to see it? Okie dokie, that's perfect, and let me do this. Why is it showing everything at one time? There we go. Okay, so any takers on this one, folks? And I have to go grab my stuff to write your names down. Okay, so I'll cancel, cancel. So I'll keep this up for you, folks. And who would, while you think about who wants to claim one through four. Need to grab pen and paper. Dr. Dahlia, are you asking the names of the of the nerves that they're pointing at, or are you just asking for the um, the certain sections of the nerves? So whatever was on your whatever was on your list. So if you guys have the list from last week. You would be, no, so not individual nerves, if that helps. Okay, so let's get that a little bit, you know, zoom in a little bit so you can see it better. Somebody's claiming this question? Yeah. Okay. Um, so do I do one, two, four, or how does it? Okay, so one and two. These are two different plexuses. So which one is which? So one, isn't that the cervical plexus and two, the brachial plexus? Yes, ma'am, you are correct. Okay, and I will get you four and three and four so you can see those. There you go. So what about three and four? Go for it, state your name and your answer. Is, um, so it's Noah. Horvat and is number three the lumbar plexus and number four the sacral or wait yeah the sacral plexus correct yep 
So, okay, who was the first one that answered? Uh, how, um, okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, so now over to five and six. Any takers on five and six? Okay. Uh, number five. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, you can go. I, I'll take number six. You can take this one. Okay, number five. <laughs> I think it's cervical enlargement. Correct. So was um, Anupam Patel. I don't know. Thank you, because I had to go back and check who's talking. Okay. So cervical enlargement is five, correct. Now, what about six? Uh, this is Michaela, and number six is the lumbar enlargement. Yes, ma'am. I got it. Okay. Now, oops, too fast. Hold on. Okay, so for this one... Seven and eight. Who would like to take over seven and eight? Is uh, is seven the anterior median fissure? Yes, it is. Can I get your name? Michael. Okay. So seven is the anterior fissure. What about eight? Um, is that the um, phylum term, 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 terminally? Phylum. Uh, the conus? The conus? conus medullaris, correct. Yep, medullaris. you got it. Yeah. Conus medullaris. Okay, so I see a couple of hands up, or I heard a couple of hands up. So, Mario, do you want to do 9 and 10? Yeah, let me go for it. Okay. So uh, nine, that's the phylum terminale. Correct. And then um, 10 is the cauda equina. You got it. Yep. And please know that this is not really a high stress quiz, OK? This is more of us kind of talking together and making sure that we know the material from last week. So if, every, if there's anything that we forgot, we can go back and review it again. It's more of like a participation thing as opposed to me really quizzing students. Okay, so you know, low stress levels. Okay, Saeed, go for it, Saeed. Um, so, so eleven is eleven is dorsal root and uh, twelve is ganglion. The dorsal root ganglion, correct. So you have you would have you know if this was a ring quiz, you would have to write in the whole thing. So dorsal root is correct, and dorsal root ganglion is correct as well. Okay, any takers for 13 and 14? Uh, I think I got them. Um, okay, this is Tala. Um, the th okay. 13, I think, is the ventral root or the rootlet, and then 14 is the spinal nerve. Yep, correct. So you are right. 13 is the rootlets. This part would be the actual root. You're absolutely right. Okay. And now I'm going to have to zoom in a little bit on these so you can see them better. Okay, so any takers on 15, 16, 17, and 18? Okay, so... Let me stop moving this so you can see what you're looking at. There you go. So again, 15, 16, 17, and 18. 16, 17, and 18 are all related. So if you know one of them, you'll be able to identify the other two. Okay, state your name and tell us what they are. Is a 15 pointing to dorsal sulcus? Um, correct. Uh, and 16, 17, and 18 are the dorsal horn, uh, vent, uh, lateral horn, and the ventral horn of the gray matter. That is correct. And you uh, are? Anupam, Anupam Patil. Oh, okay. Okay, so, yep, you got those right. Now, just a little bit. Don't, why does this move so much? Okay, 19, 20.
money and then somebody just take the rest because these are all related as well okay so who is raising their hand is that you again Anupam? or is that oh, no that was me tala. tala okay did anybody else before you go before you answer let me make sure did everybody get a chance two one two three four five six seven eight so there's one that did Rachel, did you um did you get any of those? Rachel? No, not yet. Okay. So there goes my pencil. Okay, so do you wanna give these a try or do you wanna wait for another one? Okay. Did I ever mention that I do not like computers anymore? Okay, so we were going for 19, 20, and then these three, 21, 22, and 23. And if you wanna wait for another one, that's fine, just let us know. You'll wait, okay. Um, no one likes them anymore. I agree. Like this is, you know, electronics used to be nice, but not anymore. Okay, so um, okay, so any takers on these? Okay, go for it, Mario. So nineteen. Is that the anterior fissure? Anterior median fissure? Uh huh. 20, um, 20. 20, I'm not too sure on. But I could try 21, 22, and 23. Um, those are the 23 is the dorsal um, white matter, 22 is the lateral, and then 21 is the ventral funiculus. Or Right, so we can call them ventral, lateral, and dorsal funiculi or um, tracts, okay? Okay. So, yes, they're all part of the white matter. Okay, any takers on 20, folks? Is Anybody want to? 20, okay, go, is go ahead. Is 20 the gray commissure? It is. Yep, so that gray commissure, these fibers connect the right and the left sides together, the gray matter of the right and the left sides. So you'll find that some fibers have to cross over to the opposite side, and this is where the crossover occurs. Okay, so now on to our next one. And let me zoom in. I'm just worried that if I zoom in any more that we won't be able to see a picture. <clears throat> and just to help out, these are asking about meninges, meningeal layers. So, Dr. Dahlia, I have a question. Sure. Um, is there any chance you can post these just so that we could get some practice for the the midterm and maybe the final? Sure, sure. Let me. Um, I'll send it to everybody in an email when we're done with lab. Okay. Perfect. Just like I All did right. with um, yesterday's folks. Awesome. Thank you so much. No problem. Okay, go for it, Noah. Or do you have a question? Um, I was going to try. Uh, so okay. is 24 the the PM matter or matter? And then I can't tell if 25 is the subarachnoid space or if that's where like the cerebrospinal fluid would be. Um, well, they're I'm both the sure. same. So CSF would be in the subarachnoid space. So no, you're correct. Okay, so then 26 would be the um, arachnoid um, monitor, and then the dura monitor would be 27. Okay. And did, I don't want to take up 28 if you know from somebody else if anybody else wants to do it. Just give it a guess. Just give it a wild guess. So it's above the dura. Okay, knowing that above in science means epi. So this is your epidural space. Okay, so sometimes on the exam, you kind of have to be creative if you're not sure what things are. And, um, you know, it might get right. At least you have, you know, that chance, 50-50 chance of getting it right. So above the dura, 
there's a space known as your epidural matter, or epidural space, I mean. Okay, so that is this one. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. There were a couple of hands that I heard come up. Is were those questions or were you trying to claim answers? Okay, so this you can see is a screenshot from a video. Okay, so you see now how the, that can kind of work. Okay, Rachel, did you have a question or were you going to answer one? Answer, okay, perfect. So um, I'll keep this up for a minute so you can kind of take a look at it and what we're looking at. Uh, again, one of the few skills that I hope you adopt would be Before you answer a question, you look at everything in the view. So we've got bone, and this kind of looks like, you know, one of the backbones to me. And you have a structure in the middle with two things coming out of it. Now you want to name these two structures, and in order to do so, you have to look at the bigger picture in order to figure out which one is which. So hopefully I didn't give out too many hints, but can you name 29 and 30? And again, if you're not sure, that's totally fine. Um, let me see what's going on here. Not sure. Okay, that is totally fine. Rich, are you raising your hand again or did you not? Or Mario. Okay, Mario's raising. Okay, go for it, Mario. So I'm going to guess because I'm not too sure, but I think 29 is the ventral root and 30 is the dorsal root ganglion. Well, you guessed correctly. Yep. So oh, cool. what made you think that this is ventral and this is dorsal? Uh, the dorsal kind of looks a little bulkier. So I guess, I'm guessing that's the, the ganglion. Um, okay, does anybody, can anybody think of any other clues? You said not to use the lumbar as a, as a clue, right? Or can we use it? Uh, I don't know. What do you mean not to use the lumbar as a clue? So, not sure. Like, I think I mentioned something about the spinous process last week, and I was like, oh, that's how you can tell. Um, and you're like, well, if, it, if we just show you just the spinal cord, um, how would you be able to tell? I mean, oh, you can so that tell that was on the, the model. Right. Okay. Okay. So, um, how, but there is another clue on here, like a much better clue, so that when you're answering, you are more confident of your answer. Because, you know, when you're answering, you're like, oh, I'm not sure if I'm right or not. And I want you to be answering this, you know, with full confidence that you got it right. So, who else can tell us a little clue? So, Anupam, what would be your clue be? My clue would be the uh, mm -hmm. uh, ventral horn of the gray matter. Because ventral it, horn of the gray looked, matter. Because That's the gray matter looks a bit pronounced on the ventral side. Okay, so the ventral horn is usually kind of pointed out, which that is a clue. Um, for my old eyes, okay, for my 50-year-old eyes, that might not be much of a clue. And in reality, to be honest, when we do a section of the spinal cord, it's pretty much all gray. Okay, or all. So, but no, but you are right. Definitely this. Okay, one more. One more. It's so, um, you're not, uh, I am, I'll be in two months. So yeah, you're right. I'm not yet, but I will be. So Saeed, what's your, what's your clue? Um, because um, the sensory nerve, the sensory nerve that go to the dorsal pass from the ganglion, and the ganglion shows which one is the dorsal and the other one going to be not the dorsal. Better. Okay, so you're all right. All of you are correct in using the ganglion and using the gray matter, gray matter and such. But my clue was really that this is the body of the vertebra, so this would be uh, ventral. And the spine would obviously be on the opposite side, okay? So that 
to me seems like a a bigger clue but whatever works for you is totally fine as long as you get it right okay so um you know just a couple of ways even if you're again not sure of your answer you could use all of these clues put them together to make to get the correct answer okay so are we all good on that one folks Okay, moving on to this baby. Okay, so anyone, anyone want to venture on this one? And remember, this is more of a participation quiz. So if you participate, even if you get them incorrect, that's not the point, really. The whole point is to learn, and we'll, we're discussing this together. Um, so let us see who's got their hands up. So there's Saeed and Rachel. Okay, go for it, Rachel. Sorry, can you hear me? My mic was just acting. I can. So um, I got 34. Is it the subarachnoid space? Is it? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. And 31, the, P, the dura matter? The dura, correct. Okay. Um, 32. I want to say it's arachnoid. What about 33 then? What would you name 33? Not so sure. Okay, so 33 is actually the arachnoid. Okay. What And 32 would be a space between your dura and arachnoid. So what would that be? You know what? Now to come to think of it, it wasn't on your list, so you could ignore yeah. that. It's the subdural space. Okay. Okay. Thank so, you. No problem. So thirty-one is the dura. Okay. To the left side of this would be your epidural space. Um, this would be your subdural space. That's the arachnoid, and this is the subarachnoid space. Okay. So great job on that, and we are going to go. Any okay, so if you have something being pinched off of the spinal cord, what layer would that be? Okay, so I remember there was um, Rachel, do you have your hand up again, or was it just not down from the last time? You do have, okay, so go for it, Rachel. That would be the PIA matter? That is the PIA, correct, yep. Okay, and Okay, so for this view of the spinal cord, what you are seeing is the, the cadaver is lying down prone so they're on their belly we remove the spinal processes we cut through this layer to see the spinal cord and i was about to say the name of the layer okay so what was the what is the name of that layer that you'd have to cut through to see and we have um i don't know who raised their hand first so i'm just gonna go in Alphabetical order. So, Michaela. Is that the dura? It is. You're correct. So, that is the dura. And that you can see here now the spinal cord and you can see the blood vessels and so on. So, it's a pretty cool picture. And we got more. Move on. Okay. So, 30. Now, so again, the dura matter, we opened it up. You know, we unfolded it fully so you could see the spinal cord and things coming out of it. So any takers on 37, 38, and 39? Mario, go ahead. Uh, 37, is that the dorsal root? And then 38, is that the um, ventral? Correct. And then... What about 39? Not, not too sure. Okay. That's cool. So anybody else? 
Let me see who's up there. Um, Michaela, go ahead. Is that the denticulate ligament? It is. That is the denticulate ligament, correct. Okay, so 37 is your dorsal, 38 is your ventral root, um, and then the 30, 39 is, defi is the denticulate ligament. You guys are doing awesome. Now, is this the last one? Nope. Okay, can anybody figure out what this, what on earth is this? So what is 40 and what is 41? Okay. So we're still at the spinal cord. We still have the dura, um, you know, kind of open up to see underneath it. So <coughs> where did you guys go? How? Go ahead. Is 41 the cauda equina? 41 is the ca correct cauda equina. Yep, you got that. And what about 40? Um, uh, so 40 is the tapering part of the spinal cord. So you can see here how it's tapering off. It kind of looks like a cone. So what did we name that? Oh, con conus medullaris. Got it. Okay, perfect. Dr. Delio. Yes, sir. Can you go? Sorry, it's Mario. Um, can you go back to that picture? Just out of curiosity. Yeah, where would the the um, phylum terminale be in that picture? Okay. Sure. So what you would have to do, you, we can't see it on this one. You have to take oh. all of those fibers and separate them in order to see it. So it'll come up. Maybe the next image or so, but I do have it up here. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so since you've asked, Mario, yeah, so, okay, so this is the. Yeah. Is it the phylum terminale? The 48 is the phylum terminale for sure, but oh. 47. It's kind of hazy. Is it the and I think it is, correct. Okay. okay, so again, for the phylum terminale, in order to see it, you kind of have to pull the, that current away to see, you know, that little um, thread in the middle. Okay. okay. And that was my last image up here. Okay, so let me go back here. And if nobody has any questions for me, we are all set to go. Um, Yes, Noah. Do you Noah? know um, what the structure format is going to be of the lab practical portion? Because I know that is probably coming up in a couple weeks. I'm just curious if you know. I honestly don't. Okay. If this had been, you know, what we've been doing in the past, where we go in and red flag things in the lab cadaver or the cadaver lab, I mean, um, I would be able to tell you how it would look like. But in this format, I, I have no clue. <laughs> I know we're going to have pictures up here, but is it going to be multiple choice or would you have to write it in? That's the part I don't know. So we'll be using pictures just like we've been using on our quizzes here. Um, but if it are they going to be multiple choice or are you going to be writing in the the names so spelling would count i don't know just make it participation yeah let's do the you know as long as you guys show it up you're good now that's for the quizzes folks okay so for these quizzes as long as you're here and we're discussing and you know uh, we're good oh this is all on tape isn't it shoot okay um but anyway that's pretty much what these quizzes are for to make sure that the students are participating and are learning and from how you've been answering i could tell that you guys you know, are good on the spinal cord. So when I ask you now about the brachial plexus, I'll be able to tell if you're if you got that down or not. Um, but for the actual test, you, know, you definitely have to. That's something you want to ask Dr. Ahmed about. Okay. So any other questions? Yeah, Dr. Delia. 
So, you said you're going to email 